Welcome to Roll Call. My name is Jeff Dewar, and today we're going to be talking to the fire chiefs within the county and the EMS chief within the county as we're going to talk about social distancing and face masks. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm going to call you out here first, one-on-one. I want to remember, remind everybody listening here that we are practicing our social distancing as we have our people with us today that are going to be calling in from their phones. So bear with us in that one. It'll be sound a little different. At Andrew Spaulding. Andrew, tell us who you are and what your title is. Hey, everybody. It's Andrew Spaulding. I'm the County EMS Chief of the Charles County Association of Emergency Medical Services. Thank you, Andrew. I've got uh, Mark Kaufman. Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Kaufman. I'm the uh, Charles County Fire Chief for the Charles County Volunteer Firemen's Association. I've got Ben Jenkins. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ben. I represent over 400 members of the Walter Volunteer Fire Department. We operate at three stations in the general Waldorf area, and I'm pleased to be with you guys this afternoon. And last but not least, I have a Chief Finch. Hello there, Jeff. I'm Steve Finch. I'm the Assistant Chief of EMS Operations for Charles County Department of Emergency Services. Thanks for having us today. So, Chief Jenkins, you told us you have over 400 person now. So, I'm going to ask you right off the get-go, how many calls do you run per month, and have they increased since the COVID-19 outbreak? Well, our uh, department is extremely busy. Uh, we are in a joint partnership with the Department of Emergency Services to provide fire, and uh, more importantly, EMS service to the community. Uh, our call volume uh, has remained steady. Uh, however, the call volume itself has particularly increased um, uh, running persons that are under suspicion for either having COVID or being exposed to persons with COVID. So we're remaining busy, and uh, we are rolling through the calls. Okay. that's Yeah, you sound like you're pretty busy there. Chief Spaulding. Same question for you, bud. Hey, Jeff and everybody. Yeah, um, typically for, uh, I'm with Newburg, but ultimately my title in this role is over all of the stations throughout Charles County for the Association of EMS for the Volunteers, who, as Chief Jenkins said, works in conjunction with the Department of Emergency Services. Um, Typically, we've we've seen actually a pretty drastic drop in the calls overall throughout the county. I think the last figure I heard was that we were somewhere about half or a little over half of a uh, reduction of calls. Um, in general, we are seeing a little bit of a rise in COVID patients wanting to go to the hospital as their symptoms are popping up. But um, outside of that, everything's been pretty much low key for the most part. Haven't had those crazy days that we've all come to know and love. Yeah. I'm not going to say I missed those because I'd be lying then. <laughs> Chief Finch, i going to ask you yes, the same sir. question that too, boss. Okay. Um, well, I, I think typically, uh, in the county, we're used to running 15 to 1,700 calls a month. Um, and I think we've dropped drastically, probably closer down to 12 to 1,300 calls in a month. And, um, which is, it's just good. But, uh, to elaborate on what Chief Paulding just said, uh, we're finding that even though the call volume is lower, that a higher percentage of the calls are more serious and they're becoming more, uh, more rela- in relation to the, uh, COVID-19. So, which really dovetails into a whole lot of other uh, different type of issues, which I'm sure we'll be getting into later. Okay. Now, Mark, I didn't forget about you at all because I got a question for you, too. How many volunteers do we have in the county? Uh, throughout the entire fire and EMS community, we're between twelve and 1,300 volunteers. Okay. And I guess you've noticed within the whole county an increase in calls, too, a reduction in calls or an increase in acuity? Yeah, so pretty much like what everybody said to uh, the total number of calls has decreased, which has been a positive sign. Um, it really tells us a lot. Of people are either staying home, they're following the, um, you know, the social gathering orders put out by the governor. Uh, unfortunately, just over this past weekend, uh, one thing that we did notice a rise in was motor vehicle accident, uh, which led us to believe that people are probably ready to start getting moving again and getting back out. Charles County is no stranger to running motor vehicle accidents, but over the past five to six weeks, those types of calls have been pr- fairly low. Uh, and like I said, over the weekend, it, it spiked up pretty high. So you think people started to suffer from cabin fever? Yeah, unfortunately, I think that's the case. And I think, um, you know, all of us on this call can certainly uh, attest to that as well. I mean, granted, we are you know, first responders, emergency providers, and, and we're essential and we have to go out. But at the same time, we have families at home who are who are sheltered in. We have kids at home who are homeschooling, and you know we we feel the both sides of it actually. Yeah, this is, these are definitely tough times, no doubt. Um, 
I want to roll over to Andrew Spalding, Chief Spalding. We've been encountering a lot of COVID-19 patients or an increase, rather, as we know. What kind of precautions is the EMS division taking for the personnel that are affected? I'm sorry, not affected, but that are treating these patients. Oh uh, yeah, actually, they've done they've done a tremendous amount of work to keep the safety of the providers at number one. Um, there's there's a few things working on both sides of the of, of the fence, if you will. Um, on the volunteer side, we've got the website um, that is helping our county infectious control officer Madison Brady track any contact with patients possible patients of um, possible COVID exposure. So that's really helped her with that, um, working in conjunction with Captain Robbie Jones with DES to work on tracking those patients as well. Uh, first and foremost, though, is the PPE, generally uh, speaking, where, you know, we're working with Nick Ellis with the logistics to ensure that everybody has all the proper PPE that they need, the gown, Tyvek suits, gloves, um, eye protection. Even now they're getting into the uh, shower caps that some people are calling them and boot covers and everything. So, um, you know, we're making sure all of that's flowing so that everybody has what they need. Even more interesting is the decon procedure that's being done at the hospital that uh, was a huge part of everybody in the EOC's brain work coming together, if you will. And uh, so basically every time you run any call, whether it's a PUI or not, for a COVID exposure, they are, as soon as you offload the patient, they're getting into the unit as a company. They have contracted a company out who's getting in and using a fogger system that's spraying a highly effective disinfectant in the unit, letting it sit for 10 to 15 minutes, and then they go back behind it and wipe it down uh, as a company. So essentially, they're taking your, your sterilization off of your hands, and it's getting done the same time every time. Okay. So there, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff happening that's making sure the safety of the responders is kept up to uh, up to par. There is, there is, and uh, I know being not to feel like that too. Is you, you see the difference in what's being done, and it's it's well appreciated in this end. I can tell you that right now. Um, Chief Finch, I'm going to go with you again in this one too. Same thing with uh, we just did with Andrew. I know personally what you've all been doing, but I'd like to hear what you've been doing for the PPE with your personnel and stuff too and the adjustments you may have made. So I think, yeah, he, he touched on it pretty good. We have these forms in the EOC that that, uh, for, that we have, actually they're all around the county that we have to fill out. It's the, uh, it's the form 213 that gets filled out for the uh, all the PPE stuff that we use that gets turned into logistics. It's a way of keeping track of all the PPE that we are using. And I, I have to say that right now, I think Charles County is still in pretty good shape, especially compared to other jurisdictions in the area, as far as uh, having enough PPE to look out for our own people. Um, another thing is, uh, I think Chief Balding was alluding to it earlier, uh, along with the cleaning of the units, when there are different types, and I think people will probably be, probably be interested to know this, that when we do transport, COVID positive patients and you know we always have to do this uh, check if, if, if we find out if somebody is tested positive that we transported then there's this whole in the background this, this whole wide array of uh, items that have to be done in order just to make sure that we're doing due diligence and that's with contact tracing uh, so we go back and, and uh, we go through schedules through the CAD through EMET through our EMET report to determine if somebody was uh, was in contact with a COVID patient. We, that's how we determined who it was that was in contact. Same as if somebody has an exposure, we can find out by looking at the report if there was a low exposure, a moderate to a high risk exposure. So the way we treat, uh, I think the way all of our personnel have been doing so far through this whole pandemic is they've been doing really well at making sure that they're protected when they arrive on scene. Uh, might look scary to some people, but, uh, it's just know that we're doing our best to protect our own people. And uh, it's, it's always safety is paramount in our business. Uh, it's all, it always has been. It's just we find uh, nowadays that we're finding other ways of protecting ourselves, and uh, we're doing everything that we can. And I just think that that's very important to know, for everybody to know, that because uh, it goes in line with the uh, decontaminating of the unit. If somebody has to call 911, 
then they'll know that when they're a unit rival on the scene, that all those people are doing their best, you know, as far as with the PPE. And they know that they're going to, if they have to get transported to the hospitals, we're going to be in a clean ambulance. Okay. I like that. Um, yeah, and I know, I know that procedure works out well, well too. Uh, I'm going to switch over to Chief Jenkins. You say you have about 400 personnel so divided by three stations. So that's going to tell me right there some logistics need to be done to take care of the personnel that are coming in and exiting the building. Tell me some of the procedures that you all have employed. So uh, as I think everybody could probably pick up on a team that, that's listening to this program is that uh, we have a big, a big team working together uh, with one mission in mind, and that's to keep the public safe uh, and to provide a service to the public, but also our uh, providers. So uh, working with the, that big team, as I'm going to call them, the entire county has uh, implemented a program um, loosely called wellness checks for the providers. So when personnel arrive at a, a fire or EMS station, uh, they answer a series of questions as well as take, take their temperature. Um, and that ensures that we're keeping ourselves healthy and also we're going to be able to have healthy providers to, to treat our citizens and transport our citizens to the hospital. Um, and as well, we're just, we're just also keeping um, tabs on everybody's mental health. Um, that big team that I talked about, they've um, worked hard to make sure that their services that are provided to our our, um, our emergency services providers, that if they're having any issues working through the COVID-19 pandemic and, and everything that goes along with it, that we have mental health providers available and a team um, to work with uh, the fire and EMS uh, personnel that are running these types of calls to make sure that they're healthy. Okay. Let's switch over to, I uh, thank you for that, uh, Chief. I do. Chief Kaufman, too many chiefs up here. I got like five chiefs I'm battling around here. One to my right and three in my table. So four in my table. <laughs> All right, Mark, Chief Mark, Mark Kaufman. Yes, sir. All right, thanks. Hey, so we just heard from Chief Jenkins and how we're doing this whole personnel thing like that. So that's within their stations, I'm assuming, or is this with the countywide thing? And if there's anything different, let me know what that is. No, so like Chief Jenkins uh, stated, uh, this is a countywide effort. Um, uh, this is something that was drummed up, obviously, from you know looking at other agencies, but um, inside of the Emergency Operations Center for Charles County is an array of people for intelligence, EMS, fire, police, uh, safety, uh, all kinds of individuals. And this, this one team is all about making sure the, the providers and the public is safe. Okay. So with that being said, pretty much – um, this is something that we've pushed out in a special order, um, something that I know you're not a stranger to. We have four different special orders out there, and one of those does pertain the, uh, the, the health screening of individuals when entering a fire EMS station. Tell us more about that, what the procedure is there. And, and I know it's kind of wide. You said that, too. What is the actual procedure, how you would do that? Uh, so individuals that show up to a station or, a, uh, or report for duty, um, we have one entrance that would be designated at each department. Uh, they will go in, take their temperature. There's a quick little health screening form. Uh, they just answer questions. Um, they're answering all the COVID-related questions, um, fever, cough, sore throat, body aches, chills, those kind of things. And, and we're documenting that. And they're also getting documented uh, halfway through their shift if they experience any of those symptoms. Of course, at any time, if they start experiencing any symptoms, they notify their supervisor. And depending upon what their symptoms are, they, they could be relieved from duty. So, and then, like I said, this goes around all the stations, and I believe it actually goes for some of the county buildings as well. Yes. Yes, it does. And I know that uh, we got to check in at 0700 in the morning or 0700 in the morning and then do it again at 1900 hours, over 12 hours, like you were saying there, halfway through. Um, tell me about the, uh, let's see, which one of you, Andrew, let's pick on you a little bit. I haven't picked on you very much. Are you still with us? I am. And uh, actually, I was going to offer one other thing that uh, was a pretty big change that was a, collaboration with the hospital that's also helping our providers stay safe is how they come out and get the patient from us now. Once we notify communications, we're three minutes out from the facility and then uh, pretty much they're either waiting, waiting at the door for you or with, uh, you know, within a couple minutes, they're outside to collect the patient and patient information and everything. So that's a pretty big, pretty big deal. But I know the hospital's pretty excited about being able to help us with that to A, keep 
us out of the war zone, if you will, and then plus helps them with bringing anything in from the unit itself, you know. So I Absolutely. think that's worth mentioning. There's uh, The logistics behind this that you don't see is mind-boggling. I mean, uh, just like you said, with the hospital right there at the individual stations to the countywide implementation of, of SOGs, SOPs, however you want to take yep. it. Stuff, it's, just, it's mind-boggling in itself. Yeah, and as Chief Finch said, I mean, it's all just working hand-in-hand. Hand. It's, it's really impressive. It is. It's really it's really cool to see everybody working together, too, because this is uh, we're all here together, like you keep hearing, and everybody's working together to make things happen the right way and taking care of each yep. other's yep. back, too. It's pretty cool. Um. So, Chief Spalding, let's um, tell me about the social distancing policies you have at some of your uh, ambulance and firehouses. Well, typically, uh, as as Mark Hoffman and I have talked many times over the last month and a half about it, you're really changing a culture. I mean, it, it truly is culture shock by enabling this stuff. And I mean, not just as far as citizens and being out and about, but in your firehouses and your EMS stations throughout the county. That's all you've known before is. You know, hanging out together, you're close, you're like, you know, they're really, truly a second family. You're eating dinner together, you're going out, doing stuff together. A lot of people take vacations and stuff together. And all that a matter of a couple of days has come to essentially a screeching halt. Um, you know, a lot of companies are starting to go back to just requesting home response, like your outlying companies and everything, to uh, when a call goes out, then the members come out, ride the apparatus for the call, handle the emergency and then go back home when they get back. So they're not really staying at the station. Um, the busier companies that have people that pretty much have to stay there because they, it's just not feasible for them to have home response are having to practice a lot of, you know, keeping with six feet away from each other. And when you can't wearing masks in the station and, you know, that becomes a little much because a lot of the public, when they go out to stores or stuff, they're just temporarily wearing masks where when you look at a firehouse and you're sitting here all day or all night, um, you know, it's, it's just challenging. It's uncomfortable. It's causing a lot of frustration and everything, but everybody knows it's an evil necessary and, you know, we just have to do what we have to do. So. All right. I'm, you just gave me a question. I want to ask chief Jenkins here. So with the, Andrew talking about the social distancing and home response and so on and so forth with, again, I'm picking on you because you have the three stations and they're busiest. Um, how's that affected your manpower? So it's, it's greatly affected our, our, our manpower or personnel pool. However, uh, we remain steadfast in our uh, um, need to serve the community. And we have had several members that have uh, become ill from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. However, um, we have placed into um, service several different avenues to, to make sure that the, the calls for service are answered. So the other part of um, this is that our membership is very diverse. And in that, we have um, certain portions of our membership that would be considered high risk as far as being exposed to, to, to this virus. So it's affected our membership pool because some, some of our members are doing the right thing and they're remaining at home. Um, to protect themselves and their families, but uh, we have not and will not waver in ensuring that every call for service is answered uh, for fire and EMS. Okay. All right, so thank you. Chief Finch. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. How's uh, the staff with DES working? Has anybody been taken ill, and what have you made adjustments for? And sort of share with us what you got going on there. Sure. Um, so when it all started out, you know, we had some people, and I, I think I spoke on it earlier, uh, when we have, whenever we had some mid moderate to high risk exposures, uh, we would have to put people in quarantine. And, uh, just for those that just, just to elaborate a little bit more on that, what quarantine is, is, is just, uh, putting somebody, just separating somebody from other people just for, for a period of time, uh, to make sure they haven't, you know, in, or t- until they do or, so they don't develop any symptoms of uh, COVID as opposed to the isolation where that's somebody who tested positive and then they go into isolation until they, until they met the requirements to be clear from that. Actually, what I would, I would just like to uh, elaborate on as well is uh, what, what we do is it started out as a revolving door 
except we were just the one way in. We started losing people, and then uh, we we lost probably four or five. And then after the uh, that quarantine period was up, we started getting people back. So it eventually got to the point where we had a couple actual a couple of our providers who tested positive. So they actually had to go into isolation. And so the problem with that is, you know, you're, you're just everybody. It, it, it kind of sets, for lack of a better term, a hysteria out there. And people think that we're doing everything we can to protect ourselves. But um, I think as you'll find on later on in the podcast, you know, you can no matter how you can do all the protecting you want when you're on a call. But what happens when you're not when you let your guard down, that's when things can happen. And I think we're all. And uh, Chief Jenkins, I believe, alluded to it earlier. We can, you know, as soon as we let our guard down in the firehouse, you know, it's like home to most of us. I mean, as soon as we walk home, it, we all let our guard down. It's like, man, we're, we're glad we're home in our safe space. And um, through the years, the firehouse has become that safe space for a lot of people. And I think that's what began to happen. Uh, we weren't practicing social, social distancing. And um, so right now we're at the phase in this pandemic where it's starting to affect the firehouses more than anything right now. So, and I'd like to bring this up that, you know, I think where we are right now in the, in the fire EMS community is where this country was about six, seven weeks ago. Uh, They started preaching out there. We had to start doing social distancing. Uh, You got to separate yourself from people, wash your hands, disinfect things and, and, that, and and what we do, and this is what they were preaching back then, what we do now is going to help us flatten that curve a lot sooner than it possibly could. And I think that's where we are right now in the fire EMS community is we're at that uptick on the curve. And I think that what we do in the, in the, uh, in the fire EMS community, within our, in the firehouses, at the stations, what we do now is, as far as practicing social distancing, is going to determine how soon we can flatten the curve in the firehouse. And I think that's just something that's very important uh, to, for people to understand that we see it's working in the country. I think, uh, you know, the, the, I think that curve is finally starting to flatten out in the country. In some cases, maybe starting to be on the downswing, hopefully. And uh, we just hope we can get to that point within the fire community, fire and EMS community, a lot quicker and get this and then flatten out this curve, so to speak. Okay, Chief Kaufman. Yes, sir. How? Yeah, are you seeing things in your whole association? Are you seeing anybody getting affected as well? Yeah, unfortunately, we are. Um, we had probably uh, just about a, uh, two dozen uh, who have become ill, um, and some are even testing positive and remaining asymptomatic, meaning they have no symptoms at all. Um, and then we also have people who are symptomatic who are who are testing negative. So this just as it confuses everybody else out in the real world, it's confusing us as well. Um, however, I can happily report that everybody who has uh, tested positive or who has been sick is actually on the mend at this point. Um, and we're fortunate we're on the, the downhill slope of a uh, 14-day quarantine for a lot of folks. So uh, we look by the end of the week to have 90 to 95% of those folks back on the streets and uh, providing service to the citizens. Those are good numbers, 90, I like that. Okay, we're going to uh, wrap this up as best we can. We could talk to you all for all day long on these topics right here. Really good information all four of you put together today, and I do appreciate it. And um, if you get a chance to tune into the next podcast, we're going to be talking to two people who are actually in the midst of the coronavirus that are uh, first responders. So you may want to tune into that one too. Um, any questions from anybody, hit your phone, tune in, and, and yell it out there. Uh, this is Andrew. I just wanted, not really a question, but I think a couple of people, Chief Finch, Chief Call, I'm pretty much sure everybody's made a comment. But again, just want to push out to all the providers. We're super proud of all the work you guys are doing. Um, it, it's it's impressive, as Jeff said earlier, to see it all unfolding and everything. And especially with the county fire chief and I, who are seeing a lot of behind the scenes stuff and the amount of work that's being put into this, it's just, it's it's mind blowing. So I just wanted to. Thank everybody out there for all the hard work you're doing and let you guys know if there's anything at all you need, please let us know. You know, our phones are always on and that's it. Stay safe out there. No, no questions, Jeff. Uh, this is Mark. Um, kind of just echo what Chief Spalding said. Uh, 
you know, appreciate all the hard work from everybody behind the scenes, everybody who's remaining on the front line working through this. It truly is a team effort. Um, and it's a confusing effort. And I just want everybody to understand that we understand the confusion. Uh, we're changing special orders all the time, and, and we're changing those based off of real-time information that that we're getting from our partners, you know, with CDC, the health department, um, the medical director, and everything that we're doing is in the best interest of all of our folks, keeping them safe. Uh, so frustrations do come out when things change all the time like that. And one thing that I preach a lot to people all the time is, you know, when you're working with people, you know, it's not always about the message, it's the delivery of the message. And just keeping in mind that we're all in this together, we'll get through it. We're going to have a lot of lessons learned. We have lessons learned already. Um, unfortunately, in these types of scenarios, um, we're used as a fire and EMS community, we're used to looking at past lessons learned and taking those and having time to make changes in the way that we operate. Unfortunately, with this, we have to take what we learned right away and produce something to make that change happen right away. Um, and that definitely has created some challenges, but we've definitely we've pushed through and worked together as a team. And um, if it wasn't for the support of everybody in the field, we wouldn't be as successful as we are right now. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I'm going to take this opportunity too to thank all four of you chiefs for the work you've done. Uh, we're in uncharted water here and I know you all are doing your best to do what you can do for both the public and the providers. So I want to thank you all very much for that. Um, we'll go ahead and close it out there. And um, my name is Jeff Dewar from Roll Call and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Roll Call. I'm Jeff Dewar. Today, we're going to have two individuals within the county that are actually coping with the COVID-19. So I want to introduce you to Charlie. Charlie, tell us who you are and where you're from, bro. Uh, yeah. My name is Charlie Riley. I'm a paramedic with Charles County Department of Emergency Services, born and raised here in Southern Maryland. Uh, yep, thanks for having me. No problem. Thank you for tuning in. We are practicing social distancing as both of us, these guys are at home recovering from COVID-19 signs and symptoms and have both been diagnosed with such. And so they're at home on their phones while we're actually here in the studio recording them. Josh, tell us who you are, bro. Uh, my name is uh, Joshua Sullivan. I'm a fire sergeant at ENT with the Walter Volunteer Fire Department. All right, welcome aboard. So, uh, Sully, we're going to call you. Um, tell us when this happened. What? Give us a rundown real quick of what happened and uh, how you figured out that you had signs and symptoms. I mean, what, what were they? What did they exhibit as? And what did you do? So uh, originally, uh, you know, when, when all the COVID-19 calls started coming in and all the precautions started going on, um, myself, Charlie, all of our, our station personnel uh, that were assigned at our station in Waldorf um, started taking the precautions as the CDC and the county started putting them out. Um, you know, I, it was funny, me and Charlie have actually talked about this before, um, before everything happened. Uh, we both uh, suffer from allergies pretty badly um, every, every year, this time of the year. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a ongoing thing where, you know, when we were starting to develop, you know, the, the resources and the plans and, and guides to kind of, you know, how we were going to identify people that might have been sick at the fire station or whatever. You know, a lot of people kept saying, well, we have allergies, we have allergies. So it's kind of hard to tell. Um, so for me, um, you know, my allergies had already started um, this year at that point. So I had the normal, you know, you know, slight you know, once every you know hour kind of cough kind of thing that I've always had uh, during allergy season. Um, but it wasn't until after um, a couple of our people came back positive um, that my symptoms started ramping up. So uh, originally it was just, you know, a, a, a little bit of a sinus headache where my, my uh, allergies were causing pressure um, and, a, and a little bit of a cough. Okay. Charlie, how about the same thing with you, man? Same question. Uh. Just uh, going off of what uh, Sully was talking about, we, uh, we're following CDC guidelines and using the PPE that was provided, you know, from the department. Tyvek suits and 95. I always uh, felt more confident with my Scott mask that's provided from the county for our uh, SCBA uh, with the 200 filter. That extra five percent always made me feel like I was going to be. Uh, that 100% safe from any kind of droplets, uh, protecting my airway, um, you know, uh, but not wearing PPE in the station is kind of where it, where it got us. I think we 
took all the precautions that we could out in the field, had patients come out to us that they could, uh, not going to people's houses, uh, having one provider going in at a time. Um, when we got to the hospital, we had a professional decon crew there cleaning up our units, uh, not wearing clothing into the station that were worn on calls as well as boots. Um, and at that time, we had started wearing masks in the station. We all had allergy issues and we're living in close quarters there. We were not social distancing in the station. Um, you know, and you have everybody with symptoms of allergies hanging out, eating dinner together in the kitchen, watching TV together in the day room sleeping in the same bunk rooms and, and that's where it got us in the firehouse. Yeah. And that's what we talked about in the last episode too, is about how the, uh, the, uh, learning curve of, of, you know, the firehouse or safe house where you hang out, like you said, eat, watch TV, all that kind of stuff like close quarters. Now we have to distance ourselves with social distancing and using masks and stuff too, which is totally out of character for what we've ever done before. So it's, it's definitely a, a huge learning curve. Um, Sully, um, I wanted to ask you, first of all, I'm bad. I'm real bad. I didn't ask y'all how you doing. So, Sully, how you doing? I, uh, I'm doing good. Uh, I'm on my fourth day uh, being symptom-free now. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, so I, uh, I've, I've, funny enough, and you know, I've talked to different people, I've never ran a fever uh, during this entire ordeal, um, but I'm fourth day symptom-free. Um and uh, feeling great, feeling really good. Um, a, a lot of that has to do with, I'm sure, the support of the county, the residents, the, the first responder team. Um, I, I can't speak for Charlie, but I can only assume, you know, we both kind of had viral posts and, uh, you know, it, the, the outpouring of uh, support and encouragement has been pretty, pretty amazing. So, um, you know, I, I credit a lot of feeling the way I do and feeling as good as I do with, with everybody's support. So we're feeling good. I'm glad you're feeling better, man. I was following you on Facebook there with some of your updates, and uh, yeah, I'm glad you're feeling better. Um, I appreciate it. Charlie, how are you feeling? Feeling a lot better. Uh, yeah, I've, um, probably about three days, I'd say. What I call, yeah, symptoms. Yeah, so I, have, uh, I think with this, everybody learning, well, we definitely learned with this, uh, you know, being sick, talking to Sully and talking to a couple other people that uh, tested positive that we've all kind of experienced different symptoms <clears throat> with, this, uh, with this virus. It kind of affects everybody differently. I know I'm um, not going to speak for Sully. He had some some different signs and symptoms. I had I know he particularly uh, was uh, a lot of respiratory issues, a lot of almost felt like an upper respiratory infection or severe bronchitis, a lot of difficulty breathing. I can say that my breathing is 10 times better than it was. It's still... I still get a winded um, when I try to exert myself, um, but the doctor said that's to be expected. Um, there's really no cough. Uh, you know, I have to clear clear my chest every now and then, which I'm wondering if that's allergies or, or residual from COVID-19, but feeling uh, 10 times better than I was and no fevers um, for probably four days now and no coughing spell. Uh, it's always been good. Okay. If you had to narrow down the worst symptom you had of this whole COVID-19 episode that you had, what would it be? Uh, for me, uh, definitely the difficulty breathing. Uh, I've never experienced uh, a difficulty breathing like that before. That was, um, it was pretty severe. I can see what that, that would be. Yeah, that would definitely be a top one there. How about you, Sully? I'd have to say the same. Um, I, I didn't nearly have it for the respiratory side as bad as Charlie did. Um, but the, the one day where, you know, the, the, the one main video that went viral for me, um, that day, about an hour after that video, I just, I couldn't breathe. My chest was tight. Um, I had passed, well, I'd almost passed out coming down the stairs two different times um, in that time frame. Um, but, but my, my sign would have got the worst for me, which is when I went to the ER and uh, was definitely when I couldn't breathe. It felt like you were, you were suffocating basically, um, just not getting the proper air. And so that was, that was by far the worst and the scariest for me. And Charlie, you had to go to the ER too for the same thing, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yep. I, uh, I went, uh, twice, I believe the, um, the emergency room staff was awesome. They, uh, they were you know, for being so geared up and, and, uh, being on the other side of it. I'm, I consider myself a 
pretty empathetic uh, or empathetic uh, provider when uh, with my patients, and um, I can't give them enough credit uh, at the hospital. They didn't make me feel odd or or make me feel like I was carrying some horrible virus to put on their gear. Just like they, would. Um, they protected themselves, and then they treated me with, uh, with a lot of sympathy, a lot of empathy, and they were uh, thorough. They did keep some distance like we're supposed to, but um, I really felt uh, felt good being there. A lot better than being in those struggles. Um, they were a lot of help. And, uh, yeah, so I did a couple trips to the ER there, yeah. Okay. So the CDC released a couple of um, an updated symptoms list, and I want to read this, run this by you, too, and see if they, they missed anything or something you want to elaborate on. We did the shortness of breath, so that's there. Fever, cough, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, and a new loss of taste or smell. Did that pretty much hit it all? Yeah. I meant add in for me, this is Josh, um, add in for me, I had a, a rash over my entire body for about three or four days um, that I guess I've been seeing different reports from the CDC coming out now as well, that it presents in different, different people with the different rashes. Um, but yeah, I mean, all like literally all of those above plus the rash um, is, is what I had. Okay. Charlie, you got anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, the, uh, pretty much all the above except for the repeated shaking. Uh, the fever, I usually don't get fevers. I uh, definitely got a fever with this. Um, chills, that's how I knew I was getting a fever. I uh, got a lot of body aches probably uh, two days before I started to come on the up and up and on the mend. Headaches, difficulty breathing. Um, I did absolutely the weirdest thing, lose my sense of smell and taste for probably two to three solid days there. Um, I could breathe freely through my nose. I just could not smell anything. You know, wow. it's pretty, pretty odd. That's pretty weird. Yeah. I mean, damn. <laughs> I'm not but laughing it, at it, that. I'm just like, that is weird. That would be kind of a weird sensation to lose. Uh, it, it's funny, though, because, you know, I had been hearing everybody talk about the loss of smell and the loss of taste. But legitimately, until I, I blew my nose one day, um, and, and, you know, so I think one of my family members have brought up some tissues for me. Um, and I guess it was the, the puffs that had the lotion in it. And just randomly after using these tissues for about four days, I was like, what's the smell of my tissues? And, and I, I had lost it and just didn't even realize I'd lost it. Okay. Uh, yeah, unfortunately for me, I was uh, kind of optimistic when I lost the, uh, the uh, sense of smell and the taste. Um, it would make me eat a little less, but I did not lose my appetite. How are your families? The families uh, are, so my family's doing, this is Charlie, uh, my kids are with their mom right now. Um, we have a uh, split custody and they are with her right now. Uh, it's the safest place for them at the moment. Um, kids have asked a lot of questions about when can we come back. Uh, you know, they want to see me. Uh, we're, we're getting real close to that, uh, getting real close to that, but we're just trying to play it safe. They were here when I got diagnosed. They were here when I started my quarantine, but they left immediately. Um, my fiance and her daughter are still here in the house. They've both been fine. No symptoms. Um, we've all been quarantining together. I've been separate from them. Uh, and everybody's, everybody's doing well, very healthy. Yeah. Sully, what'd you got for that? Yeah. So for me, I, uh, you know, early on, I have uh, my my parents, um, my grandparents live with my parents. My grandmother and grandfather both are, are pretty um, not healthy people with respiratory issues already. So from the very, very early onset, um, I kind of stopped myself from going over uh, to see my family um, as far as my parents and my grandparents. Um, so I haven't seen them. I mean, it's been a month and a half, almost two months. Uh, my kids live with their mother full time. Um, and, uh, same thing as Charlie, you know, it's kind of getting to the point where, you know, trying to figure out when the safest time is that you can see him again. Um, just because, you know, I, as, as uh, I, not to speak for Charlie, but I think we're, we're both in the same boat. You know, I would do anything I, I have to, to keep my kids safe and my family safe. So if it means oh, yeah. not going, you know, you know, a couple of days and, and, or a couple more weeks to not see them, if it meant them being okay, I, I think we're, we're willing to do that for the safety of them. Um, but it, it sucks. 
you know, the family, one of the things that we were talking about earlier, and I'll let Charlie kind of go in more detail if he wants, um, is that this is tough not only on the person that has it, but it also is tough, especially on the family. Um, you know, one of the things he said about the ER staff, um, I've always had a great deal of respect for the ER staff, um, but it's different when you have patients and, you know, we're all providers, so, um, you know, we all know how this is, but when you have patients that have no one with them that are scared and don't know what's going to happen, you know, that empathy and that love that you have to give them through your care is magnified a hundred times more because they don't have that support system that they might have their wife, their husband, their daughter, their son, their mother with them. Um, you know, the ER staff, you know, I just wanted to piggyback on that. It, we're, they're amazing. Um, all of them, the techs, the nurses, the doctors, everybody did a great job. Um, but, you know, the family, especially, um, they, they're dealing with this just as much as the people that are positive. Uh, like I said, Charlie, you can probably expand on that more uh, if you want. Yeah, uh, I agree with everything you said there, 110 uh, percent. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that it's uh, it, it's tough on them a lot of times. Uh, well, if you have them in the home with you, then uh, they've been exposed. So they're no longer, uh, you know, they, they have levels of um, – exposure level one level two level three exposure they're they're now level one exposure because you're in the house you're positive so what you would see on the street what you try to keep from them you've now brought brought home so you brought your work home which is something we don't want to do uh in this profession and uh you bring it home and now they have to deal with it they didn't sign up for it they, they signed up to be with you but you're supposed to leave that um so you almost feel like a failure bringing it bringing it home to the house and now the family has to deal with it um in a way, I know you beat yourself up a lot when you're when you're isolated and you have a lot of time to think, um, as I did with this uh, quarantine and and being sick. Um, and that's not something you want them to have to deal with and have to worry about. And then also, uh, you know, we're older now, but our parents still worry about us, and they can't they can't come and stand in the room with you or talk to you or see how you're doing physically face to face because it's too much of a risk. So you have family members who are uh, concerned about you, want to care for you, want to take care of you, and they can't. Um, it's it's not safe. You're uh, So everyone feels isolated through this because somebody's sick. And uh, I know for, for myself, having my fiance and her daughter living here full-time, um, you know, they're in the line of fire. Even if we're in separate rooms, they're, they're here. It's, it's, this thing is airborne. So uh, it's, it's tough on everybody. It affects everybody. I just want to thank you both for sharing your experience with us and telling us what, what it's like to have this COVID-19. I mean, we all have seen good sick people, but to hear from your own like that, is, it puts in a different perspective. Um, God love you all both for what you've done, and um, we definitely want you to get better and get better soon. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Thank you all for tuning in. This is Jeff, and that was Roll Call. <laughs>